How are you? Awesome. awesome. All right. It will get better. It's awesome. <laughs> That's funny. It's awesome, but it will get better. Uh, <laughs> I heard that from Pastor David Ashwick. David Ashwick. All right. Well, I'm not surprised you heard it from him. Okay. <laughs> so, so, uh, Mary, how do you feel? Weren't you feeling badly? Who was it feeling badly? Someone was not feeling well. Okay, how are you feeling? I'm here. You're here. All right. You're awesome. It'll get better. Okay. All right. Well, it's now five to eight. How much time do I have? Till you're done. Till I done? Okay, until I'm done. All right. I'll be done before 8.30 comfortably. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I stand here in this desk as your son and your servant. You know what I can do and can't do. You know my strengths and my weaknesses. And you know I'm not the one who volunteered to be here. So, Father, as I fulfill this assignment sent to me by you, I ask you, please, as an act of mercy, to speak through me. Restrain self, that only your voice may be heard. Give me, Lord, not only the right words, but the right sequence of thoughts and the right spirit with which to express these thoughts. I cling desperately to the words of Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9, which say, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Put your words in my mouth, Father. And Lord, restrain the devil as he tries to distract people from hearing these critical words that your manservant has. They'll be distracted either by cell phones they forgot to turn off, a neighbor talking to them, or they're talking to neighbors. Lord, whatever, do what you need to do to keep us focused for the next few minutes, that the message may get through only for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go with me to Genesis chapter 39. Genesis 39. And before I tell you what verse, let me tell you this. When I am traveling by air, if I'm going Let's say from here to Dallas, the plane travels at about 300 miles per hour. If I'm flying from here to London, probably travels about 560, 600 miles per hour. At an elevation is about 36,000 feet, sometimes 39,000 feet. 560 miles per hour at that elevation, intercontinental travel is considered safe. When I leave here tomorrow and I travel back to Ann Arbor, I will not travel at 560 miles per hour. I will do whatever the speed limit says, 70 perhaps on the highway, 45 and less in a more residential areas, 25 in school districts, 15 in a parking lot. 560, 600, 70, 55, 40, 25, 10, why all the changes in speeds? Why not set one speed? The speed limit in the United States is 500 miles per hour. <laughs> in the air, on the road, in parking lots, school districts, 500 miles. On a dirt road or a four-lane highway. Why do we have all these different speeds, this variation Safety, says Daniel. Now listen carefully to me. I've entitled this presentation, Out of Body Experience. You heard Dr. Pippin say we're looking for facilities in Ann Arbor from which we can a function. And we have gone looking at houses, and we were looking at this particular house. I don't recall exactly who was with us. I think you were there. Israel might have been there. I don't recall if Justin was there. 
or if, or if Elena was there. But this particular house, the owner clearly believed in out-of-body experiences. Because whenever I go to these houses, the first thing I look for are the books. I'm not concerned with the size of the room. I look at the books. I leave that for Elena, Dr. Pippin, those who are more skilled at estimating how much in the room they need. I look at the books, and his books were on astral projection. How to travel out of your body. So I thought to myself, I don't know if we want this house. I'm not sure what spirit resides <laughs> in this house. Really, I, I did say that, you know, I, I'm not sure we want this house. We may have to do more cleaning than we suspect. <laughs> so I, but today I want to talk about out-of-body living. Now we go back to the speeds. Safety. 35 miles per hour is a what? That's a, give me another word that starts with L but have fewer letters. It's a law. That's a law. The law says 35 in residential areas. The law says 25 when school is in session. The law says 45 when highway workers are working. So the law says 15, the law says 25, the law says 45, the law says 500. On the highway, cars are separated by just a few feet. Up there, there's 1,000 feet vertical separation. And even greater uh, was this horizontal separation. That's the law. What is safety? What is safety? Is that a law? No. no. What is safety? It's a good idea. Yes, it's a good idea. Yes. <laughs> I see you had too much food. It's a good idea. <laughs> safety is a good idea, but give me another word. What is, if 35 is a law, safety is what? A principle. Now, if you travel at 35 simply to avoid getting a ticket. When you reach that part of the road when you are sure there are no policemen, what will happen? You'll do 50. Because you are controlled by what? The law, not by the principle. I hope you're listening. I'm trying to make it simple. The principle of safety simply says, I care about pedestrians, about other drivers, animals that may cross the road. I care about what happens to them. So whether there's a police car hiding in the bush or not, I am concerned about other living beings that may be using this strip of road and for that reason I travel at a safe speed even if no law existed that says 25 in a school district because of my love for life I'll come to that district at a slower speed living not by laws but by principles. And we have to find the principle in every setting. A few weeks ago, I went down to North Carolina to speak to the employees of American Airlines. And I spoke on this subject. And I said, when you leave home in the morning, you come to the office. What is the principle that drives you? What? If you don't come on the basis of a principle, you will become irritated by the first person on the other end of the line who uses words not found in your dictionary or who has an attitude. But when you recognize and understand and abide by the principle of service, the principle of service says, I am not here to be served. Wasn't that Christ's principle? Mm -hmm. I am here, finish it for me, Jesus. to serve. And how you respond to me does not affect 
that principle. Many of you are in school, you may have, how many of you have roommates? You have roommates. How many of you have unsaved roommates? All right. Or saved roommates makes no difference. You don't play the music softly because there's a law. You keep your music down. You come in at a certain time. You clean up your side of the room. You don't make a mess because you are aware of the principle of respect. That's all. As long as that principle abides in your heart, the dean never has to come to settle any arguments. Virtually impossible that that will ever happen. Because Principle living takes you outside of yourself. I am of the suspicion now that I am not getting through to you. Who is not understanding what I'm saying? Lace your left hand. Who is understanding? Raise your right hand. Okay. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Was that the truth? I want you to understand because then we're going to go to Genesis. We will go to Genesis 39. Principled living takes you outside of yourself. That is an out-of-body experience. What's the greatest principle in the universe? Quickly. Love. Now, in what direction is love focused? That's an out-of-self, out-of-body experience love. And Calvary is the greatest demonstration of the principle of love. Now look at the Ten Commandments. There are ten laws. Designed to help us live up to what? The principle of love. There's one principle, the principle of love. Love for God and love for your fellow man. How are they united? If you don't love your fellow man, you don't love God. Love has nothing to do with me. I say again, principled living is that which takes us out of ourselves. Let me say something else about principles. They never change. Speed limits change because there are laws. The principle of safety will remain unchanged. Let's go to Genesis 39. It's uh, 7 after 8. Reading from verse 1, reading from the King James Version. Genesis 39. Our subject, I believe I said, was an out-of-body living or out-of-body experience. I heard a cell phone or something similar to it. Genesis 39, reading from verse 1. The Bible says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. Verse 2, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now notice, we have the word Egyptian in verse 1. We have Egyptian in verse 2. We'll come to Egyptian again in verse 5. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him and he made him overseer over his house and all that he had he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had that the Lord blessed whom? The Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field, and he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. We know the story. We also know what happened. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, verse 6, 7 of Genesis 39. And she said, Lie with me. But he refused. And said unto his master's wife, My master wotteth not what is with me. 
in this house. And he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and do what? Sin against God. And we know the rest of that story. She lied. Joseph now is put in prison. We're talking about out-of-body experience. Principles. Verse 20. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. Verse 21. I like how that begins. But, but, the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. The keeper of the prison and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand. Why? Because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Now let's examine the principal part of this experience. Look at verse 2. How does it begin? The Lord was with Joseph. What was his condition at the time? He was a slave. He had been bought by Potiphar from the Ishmaelites, by the way, who were related to him. Are you with me? The Ishmaelites, they were descendants of Ishmael. Ishmael was the, half, well, the, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the grandfather of Joseph, of Joseph's uh, father. So the great-grandfather of Joseph, I think I have that correct. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Great-grandfather. Relatives. That's another story altogether. <laughs> But the Lord, and the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man while he was in what condition? Slavery. What excuse do you have for not doing well, given whatever circumstances life may have served you on a platter? What excuse do you have? Are you the only black person in a white company? So what? Are you the only white person in a green company? So what? Are you, only, are you the only woman in a male-dominated environment? So what? How does that, how does that restrict God's ability to shine through you? Verse 3. And his master did what? Saw. So. What? That the Lord was with him. Twice we have the Lord was with him, verse 2. His master saw, verse 3, that the Lord was with him. Someone, the, 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 the person who validates your experience with Christ, most convincingly, is an unbeliever. It's the second time I'm of the suspicion that you did not get what I just said. When church members tell you, oh, you're a nice person, all of you are of the same environment, the same religious culture, we have the same expectations. But when someone who does not know God recognizes a God in you, that is a validation. And so it's not enough to say I'm a Christian. Can an unbeliever recognize and sense that this God is with me? And the Bible says, his master saw. Who was his master? Potiphar. Who was Potiphar? An Egyptian. What were the Egyptians religiously? Pagans. I, they worshipped the dog, the cat, the hawk, the hippopotamus. The, 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 did I say the cat? The dog. The crocodile. The hyena, the snake. That's why we have the Egyptian mentioned three times. You see, here's the Hebrew. The son of Abraham, to whom were entrusted the oracles of God. So here is a child of God, one. Hmm? One. Up against how many? A nation. 
one and a nation. How quickly would you run from those odds? But we've heard the saying, one plus God is what? Majority. Mm -hmm. But the one plus God, we have no concerns about God. We have concerns about the one. Is that person absolutely God's? Or does that person have sympathy for the world? Verse 4 of Genesis 39, And Joseph found grace in his sight. How did that happen? What does that mean? Modernize that expression, Joseph found grace in his sight. What does that mean? Pharaoh what? Uh, uh, Potiphar what? He liked him, someone else. Joseph found grace in his sight. Respect, someone else. Joseph found grace in his sight. Quickly, we're running out of time. Honor, someone else. Joseph found grace in his sight. Promotion. Or a promotion, someone else. Joseph found grace in his sight. He saw his potential. He saw his potential, someone else. Joseph found grace in his sight. Favor. What? Favor. favor. Everything is right. I just like favor. <laughs> favor he found in his sight. Now, how does an unbeliever have favor for the believer? That is not supposed to happen. Because you know why Cain killed Abel? Why? Abel was righteous and Cain was wicked. Wickedness does not hold righteousness favorably. Are you following me? Here we have the Egyptian paganism, heathenism, idol worship, which God detests. Here we have one Hebrew. Yet the Hebrew finds favor. In the sight of the pagan, how? Go to Exodus 3.21. Let's see how God does this for the entire Hebrew nation. Then we can work back and see how he did it for Joseph, one member of that nation. It's now 8.15. 8, you have Exodus 3.21? <laughs> no. Sister Leora, we love you very much. <laughs> And we are determined to love you more each day. All right. <laughs> now, do you have the King James Version, my good sister? No, I have Ah, all right, new king, okay. Read from it nonetheless. Exodus 3, 21, nice and loud. And I will give this people... Pause. Who's speaking? God. God says, and I will give whom? This people, what? Favor, where? In the sight of the Egyptian stop. No, finish it. And it shall... That when ye go out, ye shall not. You see, God had predicted to Abraham in Genesis 15, verse 14, that they shall serve this, uh, a foreign nation 400 years. Afterwards, shall they come out with great substance. Now, how does a slave nation emerge from slavery with great substance? It doesn't happen. In World War II, Japanese Americans were interned. You know about that history. A few years ago, the government apologized and made financial reparations. You know how the Native Americans were treated badly? Some form of reparations have been made, set aside land for reservations or whatever they call them. Blacks have been trying to get reparations for slavery because they didn't come out with great substance. How did the Israelites come out with great substance? Exodus 3.21, God said, I will touch the hearts of the Egyptians. And I will tell them, give the Israelites money. When God does that to a person's heart, the person has no what? No choice in the matter. You tell me God doesn't force people. Yes, he does. He doesn't force you to accept him. Was it Pharaoh's will to let the Israelites go? Did God force him? Oh, yes, up to the point of killing him. On behalf of his people and his work, God will force circumstances. And so Joseph found grace in his sight. God put it on Potiphar's heart. Take care of that boy. That's my boy. You're the only believer in a heathen environment. Be faithful to God. Amen. That's your only worry. Not the unbelievers. Your worry must be, am I straight with God? 
Not am I hip with everyone else? Am I following what they do? Am I in with the crowd? That's not your business. Your business is be in with God. That's a crowd of two. And that's all you need if you do that. God will turn a nation around for your sake. Verse 4 says, And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house. Now read the last part of verse 4. And by for now. What does verse 6 say? First part. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. Let's go to chapter, let's go to verse 20. Now Joseph's in prison. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. Verse 21. You start that verse for me. But the Lord was with him. Now, where is Joseph? In prison. Where did he begin? Slavery. Then he was promoted to what? In, now, Potiphar was an influential man. He was the, the captain of the bodyguard of Pharaoh, so it appears. Influential man. Joseph is in charge of everything. He goes from a slave. He remains faithful to God. God elevates him to the head of Potiphar's house. Now God has to test him again. He does no sin. You don't have to sin to suffer. God wants to test you because I have a higher position for you. And the first test qualified you for this. Now I'm preparing you for that. That test won't do. I need a tougher test. So the Lord allowed him to go where? Prison. But the Lord, verse 21 says, the Lord, that did not change. We've got to be Christians regardless of our circumstances. You're not a Christian because you're employed. When you get fired and you can't pay the rent, you're no longer a Christian. Where is God? Mm. There has to be something unchanging and that thing is a principle. And the principle of a Christian's life is dependence. I depend on God. The moment God created, the principle of dependence was introduced because all creation depends on God, animate and inanimate. The principle of dependence is unaffected by our human circumstances. And so the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. Read the next part for me now. And gave him favor. That's what he did for him with Polyphar in verse 4 of chapter 39. He gave him favor. Why? Because Joseph did not change. He remained faithful to God. And as Joseph was consistent in his witness, God was consistent in his response. He gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Now, how much did Potiphar put in Joseph's hand? All. Let's read verse 22. And the keeper of the prison did what? Committed what? All the prisoners that were in the prison. Do you understand what you just read? Who runs prisons? I'm not trying to be funny. It's a very serious question. Who runs prisons? Wardens. Who ran that prison? Joseph. Give me another name for Joseph now. Prisoner. How can you ever know exactly what God will do? Verse 23. The keeper... Now before we read 23, let's go back to verse 5. Verse 6. Let's go to verse 6. Then we go to 23. Verse 6 says, and he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. Now read the next part with me. And he knew not what he had. He had no clue. <laughs> Does anyone trust you that much? Does Dr. Pippin know how much money we have in campus ministries? Or are you the only one who knows, Sister Ellie? <laughs> Does Dr. Gallimore know? Only Joseph knew how much money Potiphar had. He did not know, the Bible says, save the bread which he did eat. 
So someone spending the weekend at Potiphar's house sits down for breakfast. She says, Potiphar, this house, all the land, the cattle, the sheep, how much are you worth? I don't know. All I know is that grits and eggs and orange juice, and that's all I know I have. That's what the Bible says. That's all I know. How come Potiphar, you don't know? Potiphar said, I don't need to know. Why? That guy knows. And as long as he knows, I don't need to know. Ah, that's trust. Now, to show you how principles don't change, and God's response to principles does not change either, let's go now to verse 23 of chapter 39. The Bible says, read with me, the keeper of the prison did what? Look not to what? Anything that was? Why? It's right there. Why? Because the Lord was with him. Now, do you see consistency? Joseph never left God. And God never left Joseph. Joseph's life was lived for God. That's out of body. His principle was God ahead of me. 825. God. With his brothers, God. In that pit, put there by his brothers, God. The Ishmaelites bought him, God. He didn't know where he was going. Ended up in Egypt, on the trading block, God. Along comes Potiphar and buys him, God. Starts to work for Potiphar, God. He's promoted, God. You know, when we get promoted, that's when we leave God. Oh, I'm flying high. I don't need God. Like the wind beneath my wings. I'll I'll handle it. Until we get shot by some circumstance and we fall like a wounded duck. In prison, before prison, under severe temptation. God. In prison. God. Lord is it. That principle which never changed in Joseph, produced consistent outcomes. Now let's go to chapter 41. Joseph interprets the dreams for Pharaoh. Pharaoh is so impressed in verse 40 of Genesis 41. The Bible says, Thou shalt be over my house, According unto thy word shall most of my people be ruled. All. Only in the throne. In other words, Joseph, you won't be Pharaoh, you'll be everything else. Look at verse 41. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, what? See, I have set thee over all the land of each, all. All was put into his hands by Potiphar. All was put into his hands by the keeper of the prison. All was put into his hands by Pharaoh. All. Consistency of the effect of that principle which operated consistently in Joseph's life. We must not doubt the power of doing right. Look at verse 55 of chapter 41. Now the famine has begun. As Joseph had predicted. The Bible says, and when all the land of Egypt was what? Famish. The Egyptians did what? The people cried to whom? Pharaoh for? And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians. What do you say? Go to Joseph. Joseph. Read, finish it now. What he saith to you, how much should you do of what he says? All. What was Pharaoh saying? What else was he saying? Who's running this country? (laughs) Don't come to me. Go to that Hebrew. Go to that non-Egyptian. Go to that boy who always has a scroll reading funny words. Go to that boy whenever I pass by his room in the morning... He's on his knees. Go to that young, he's now probably 30-something. Go to that man who always singing funny songs. (laughs) 
go to that man whom the women just can't get him to act as though his head is on a swivel. No matter how they dress. Go to him. Go to him. Principle. Not law. You know when the Ten Commandments were actually written down? After sin. Before sin, they were just the power of principle. Says Darius, you'll come into contact with the lady. Where's Darius? With a lady called Ellen White. Fall in love with her and her writings. She said, when 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 Lucifer sinned, the fact that there was a law came to the angels as a surprise. <laughs> See, as she uses the word an awakening, they did not know there was a law. And yet, what kind of lives did they live before God? Obedient lives. The Power of a principle. You see, when you fall in love with the principle, it produces lawful living. I don't need a law. No decent mother needs a law to feed her child from the state of Michigan. She feeds the child driven by love for the child. I don't need a law. But sin has so corrupted our minds, our powers of comprehension, we need laws. But grace and redemption and salvation, the power exists therein to so transform us that we go back to living by principles. Because that's how we live in the kingdom when Jesus comes. A principled life, an out-of-body experience. Because principles take the focus off you. But the Lord was with Joseph. That's a principle. I live a life of dependence on God. Man says to you, your boyfriend says, sleep with me because you love me. If you love me, I'll marry you. Uh -uh, well, I'll find someone else to marry me. I'm not sure God found you for me in the first place. Or vice versa, God will find me some other woman. Not you. Let's go clubbing. That's not why God gave me life. To spend it clubbing? Mm -mm. No, let's go drinking and smoking dope. No, 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 no. That does not fit my principle. Not a particular law. Not because the government says no. The principle... You know, health is a principle too. So my beloved brothers and sisters, let us try to identify the principle in every situation. You're taking an exam, and the answer sheet is right there. The absent-minded professor left it right there. And it's in large type because he's legally blind. <laughs> and you will not turn to the left. Why? The principle of Honesty and integrity will not put me, as a matter of fact, you turn your desk <laughs> and you take the exam this way, the same way the Israelites turn their back to the rising sun. Can somebody say amen for principle? Amen. Would it be too much for me to ask you and myself, can we make a commitment now the Lord help me one day at a time to live by principles. Is that asking too much? No. Then raise your right hand if you'll do that. Stand up. Principled living. And God has very few people who live by principle. I tell you, one of the most beautiful sights is a principled life. It generates opposition because it puts the sinner at, makes the sinner ill at ease. And either I get out of your presence or you get out of mine. That's why Jesus could only last three and a half years in his public ministry. The world could not stand it. Couldn't take it. 
Perhaps you've experienced uh, resentment in school because you, I don't smoke, I don't club, I don't drink, I'm not a wild person. And your friends, who do you think you are? I never said I was anybody. <laughs> I never said I was anyone. I simply don't. Who do you think you're better than I am? I didn't say that. It generates opposition. So be prepared. As you live the right life, the enemy comes in to test the integrity of your metal. Has to be tested. Joseph passed. Daniel passed, even at the risk of his life. I'll tell you quickly, I was in 25 to 9, I was in South Africa a few years ago preaching in a church one Friday night. And I said, how many of you love Jesus? And every hand went up. Always works. And I said, how many of you tonight would die for Christ? Tonight, not a hand went up. Not one hand went up. Now, we'll die for drugs. Because you know it'll kill you. We'll bungee jump, it'll kill you. We will, you know, race around 90 miles per hour on a hairpin bend. It'll kill you. We'll do it. We have unprotected sex and uh, uh, we'll do it. Kill you dead. We'll do it. Will you die for me? Mm-mm. 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 Won't you risk your life for me? No, but you risk your life in every other way. I know, but not for you. You're a Christian? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Can't you tell? Mm-mm. How many of you would die tonight? Not a hand went up. And I won't ask you that. Don't fidget. I won't ask you. When the service was over, I was in a parking lot shaking hands, you know, how people do. And I felt a jab in my thigh, and I looked down, little girl. So I just tapped on her head. You know how, you know, uh, what's, what's the word? Condescending you out a little. She went, hi, hi, hi. Kept talking to the adult. So she jabbed me again. <laughs> So I looked down, I said, hello, little darling, how are you? She said, she said, I want to tell you something. She was 11 years old. Anyone here 11 years old or a little older? Okay, 11, 11, 11, okay. 10, 9, you know. And she said, I said, what? She said, when you asked who will die for Christ right now, I raised my hand, but you didn't see it. Oh, my heart melted like butter at noonday. And I just turned to her. I, oh, I put my arms. I said, oh, my little darling, I'm so happy. But until Jesus tells you himself to die, you live for him. Amen. But she wanted me to know she had raised her hand. She was ready to die. A child will always lead them. And all the grown-up hypocrites now raise one hand. God doesn't joke. There comes a time when God tests your so-called commitment to him. You know, Eloi says, when the time of trouble begins, a large class. Now, statistically, how much is a large class of those who have professed faith in God's word will do what? Leave. Now, let's apply that statistically. How much of us is a large class? How many of us are here? Let's say 50. Watch a large class or a large percentage, a large proportion. How much is that? How many? All right. 35% is a large class? Okay, fine. Let's add that to what Jesus said in Matthew 7. Most people will go the wrong road. Few go the right road. How much is that now out of 50? Out of 50. Okay, good. 40. Which of you is in the 40? Which of us? Is in the 40, let me put it that way. And which of us in the 10? Now, you may think, ah, that doesn't apply to me now. The time of trouble is 2,000. Mm-hmm. You don't know when your time of trouble comes. You see, there's close of probation generally. There's close of probation personally. There's a time of trouble generally. There's a time of trouble personally. What group will we be in those who leave and finally show that they really were nothing? <laughs> or is it possible all of us will be in the group that remains? We can commit ourselves to that. And so you raised your hand, Lord, help me to live principal life. And I raise mine with you. Were you serious? Raise your right hand again. 
Hands down, let's pray. Before I pray, is there anyone who feels you need special prayer? You say, Father, I don't know if I'm at the point right now where I can take on a severe test. I don't know. If that describes you, come and stand right here quickly. If it doesn't describe you, then I'll just pray. If you, if you, you know what, I don't know I can handle a severe test. Come and stand right here to my left. I don't know if I can handle it. You come and stand right here. I'll pray two prayers for this group, for that group. While I pray, you say in your heart, Lord, I believe I can. Reinforce that certainty. Give me more spiritual fortitude. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I have no other name by which to come. I have no other one to come to. Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive our sins. Forgive us for having the potential to sin. Lord, this is very, very serious, not just a weekend where we get away from classes and work and the hustle and bustle of city living. This is serious business. Your sons and your daughters have come forward to say they are not sure they could pass a Joseph test. Lord, you admire honesty. And I'm asking you now in the name of Jesus, put into them a heart of iron, a spiritual spine of steel that will not bend, will not break, but that will resist the fiercest temptations and only allow such temptations, their God, for which they are spiritually capable. But let them grow with each passing day. Please sustain them, my God. Put into their hearts a love for principled living and almost an immunity against the infections of this world in which we live. Now, Lord, my brothers and sisters who are standing back there, Lord, keep them strong in their determination to die rather than to dishonor you. And, Father, when the time of trouble comes, let it find us like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego willing to be burnt to a crisp than to dishonor you in one little thing. Let us be found ready like Daniel to be chewed by lions than to disgrace you by praying to flesh. Oh, Father, let us live with a sense of urgency that life can end any time. So let us leave this place, I pray, with a personal decision, independent of friends, family, and spouses, a personal decision that if everyone leaves you, I will remain faithful <coughs> by your grace. Hear this humble prayer I plead from my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And I covered both groups in the prayer, so I'll just offer one Pray, God bless you, and I say it from my heart, God bless you. Let us all pray for one another. Let us all live principled lives. Thank you, and God bless you. You may return to your seats.